Hello, welcome to a very special episode of Swiss Watch Gang. Since the beginning of my channel and always when I post a new video about the watch I purchased, people have been DMing me and asking me on all the different platforms, hey Marco, which watches do you actually own, keep, what does your journey look like? And also like, would you do a watch collection video? So today is the day, I'm gonna take you throughout my journey from the first watches until the last watches that I bought and also everything in between a few mistakes that I made, and also where do I find all these watches. So stay tuned, it's gonna be a hell of a show. So let's start at the beginning. The first watch that I bought was actually the watch that was featured in my My Story video. It's the watch I bought before I moved to Switzerland. So this goes back to 2011. The story about this watch is very, you know, pure. I asked my grandmother to lend me 200 euros so I can go buy my first, you know, automatic watch. And I told her it's gonna be an Omega, so she was very proud of me. As soon as I came home and I brought this watch and she saw it, she was very <laughs> disappointed and angry at me because I bought a used old vintage watch and she was expecting me, you know, to come with a bright and shiny watch, like a new model. Um, now the dial looks like new, of course, but if you remember my old video, I actually replaced the dial when I came to Switzerland. So this is the original dial that I got. And after I moved to Zurich, I actually went to a repair shop and I told the guy, hey, I want this watch to look brand spanking new and I also change the oils and everything. So I paid around 1000 Swiss francs for repairing this watch visually and also internally. And again, it's something I will never sell because this basically started my watch collecting journey. And I think everybody, if they can, should keep the, these watches and never be, you know, ashamed of them, for example. My first years when I moved to Switzerland, I was actually working in a restaurant. So I was a bartender. And as a bartender, I couldn't, you know, not have a watch. That's why I bought a lot of Swatch watches, um, you know, just be basically to show that I care about watches. And as soon as the System 51 collection came out, I immediately bought that. At the time, I also had an AP, that was 2012. And my boss, I remember, he told me, Marco, don't wear an AP to work because you will not get any tips. Of course, he was right, huh? And that's why I bought a Swatch System 51. I bought the black and the blue, and also the red version, as you can see here. They're all scratched up because, you know, it's like a plastic composite or something but this was a watch I was proud to you know wear and also it showed that I'm a watch geek you know because when somebody saw me wearing this watch they immediately knew oh okay this guy's a bartender but you know he still likes watches and if you know the sister 51 has a nice rotor on the back um, with like a transparent crystal or something um, and again it's just a connoisseur's watch let's say for a very affordable price point Moving on, I got this watch as a gift from my cousin and I really, uh, you know, cherish it. It's a very small watch, I don't wear it much often. The last time I wore this watch was actually this year for the Swiss National Day. The most important holiday basically in Switzerland. Because it has all the cantons on the strap here. With like a little funny twist to them. So you see, let's say, uh, here you have Zurich. And there's like a rubber duckling, uh, you know, going downwards. You also have Geneva here, and the one half of uh, the like the logo has like a turkey on it, you know? It's like a funny twist on Swiss cantons, basically. So this is my watch. It doesn't run, I have to change the batteries, but again, I wear it once a year, so when I do, I don't even care about, you know, what time it is on this watch. Moving on, you maybe saw this from afar. There's a very special watch here. Uh, you know, I think watch collecting doesn't really have to be expensive. It has to be also fun. So one year, I can't remember which year this was, I was at SIHH in Geneva. And I met my friend Zurab from Swiss Watches on Instagram. And his friend had this watch on his wrist. And I was immediately, you know, mesmerized by it because again, as probably most of you guys, I grew up with Nintendo. I had a, uh, like a Game Boy Color when I, back in my days. And I played Pokemon on them, you know, just a insider information. So when I saw this watch, I have to have it. And I asked the guy, hey, listen, I, uh, 
what is this watch or where did you buy it? He told me, you know, the name and where, where he bought it. And I immediately went online and I purchased this watch. It's not expensive. I don't remember the price. I would say now it's around maybe a hundred bucks. Not sure, maybe it's even less. And I sometimes wear it just when I feel, you know, playful or, you know, like uh, I want to be a child again for a few moments in my day, maybe. So again, watch collecting doesn't always have to be fancy gold, you know, repeaters. It can also be simple like this, as long as you have fun, you know, collecting and wearing the watch. Then I have a few watches here, which are from my internet online, you know, watch hunting uh, era. So this is the one of the first watches I bought in Switzerland as well on the online platform called Ricardo. Ricardo is the biggest the second-hand e-commerce platform in Switzerland. So I bought this Cortebert watch, which is probably my oldest watch from the 1920s, so as far as I know. The loom on the hands is uh, still, you know, holding on, but barely. It has like cool Art Deco indexes, a small second hand at six o'clock. And when you wind it, you can only wind it, you know, in this direction. And it's very loud. See? It's super loud. And if you wind the crown in the other direction, it actually unscrews, so you, you don't do that. Um, I cannot open the case back. I did it once, but never again, because again, it's a very old watch and it's gonna probably fall apart. But this is just something I bought and I just, you know, keep. I don't wear it because, you know, the size is not really something that's fit for my wrist. No, but looking at it now, it's not that bad. And I don't know what the case material is. Again, I can't sell it, so I'm just gonna keep it. The next watch I bought was actually also very affordable and as well on Ricardo. As I mentioned a few times, you know, throughout this year, I'm a big fan of teardrop lugs or like uh, cow horn lugs. And this watch really spoke to me. It's a Pierce watch with uh, what seems to be applied indexes and very you know, pointy hands. And the logo is also applied. It's yellow gold coated. It's not real gold, as you can also see on the back by this cover. But again, it's a watch I really, you know, admire in terms of the design language. And once I put it on my wrist, it's also not so bad. It's actually 36 millimeters in diameter, which for the 1970s is not a small size. And I put it on this nice ostrich leather strap, which if I'm not mistaken is uh, made by Jeger Le Coultre. Yes, exactly. And it has this quick, you know, strap change, uh, you know, system here. Again, I don't wear this a lot, but I just can't, uh, you know, part ways with it. Another watch that I have a lot of interest in when I wear it sometimes at watch fairs is this beautiful Longines. So this Longines also has, you know, corn de vache or, you know, teardrop lugs, beautiful stainless steel case and a very nice salmon dial. The indexes are also, you know, salmon, very patinated as well as the hands, which are blue. Again, this watch is for me you know, almost everything I need in a watch. It's also very wearable because the size is like the Pierce watch around 36 millimeters. It has a slim profile and the lugs are really cool. What also surprised me is when I opened the case pack of this watch, which you see is beautiful as well, I found a very nice movement inside. I didn't know vintage Longines watches were so beautiful back in the days. And I kind of miss this today in their, you know, selection. But I think if they would bring this back, they would have a, you know, a lot of success with the, you know, watch connoisseurs per se. So this is again a watch I will uh, not sell very easily. I get inquiries about it all the time, but it's not something I'm gonna, you know, get rid of anytime soon. For those of you who know me, you know that I love minute repeaters and I love, you know, this type of complication. So forever I was searching for a pocket watch that would feature something similar. What I found was again on Ricardo, this pocket watch, which was actually made by, I don't know who exactly, but it was retailed by Gali in Zurich. It's a retailer who is still present there today. It has a porcelain dial with like Breguet numerals and the dial is, you know, a bit bashed on the bottom. It just comes with time. I think this watch is from 1920s or 1918, something around there. And it's in full uh, yellow gold. And the most beautiful part about it is, when you open it, actually you can see the movement, which is just gorgeous. You see the movement is beautiful. It has a quarter repeater, not a minute repeater, but a quarter repeater movement. You can see it has also beautiful, you know, cottage nape decoration on the bridges, 
and Anglage. And the most magnificent thing about it is the sound. Although it's a very old watch, again, almost 100 years old, the sound is still beautiful. Let's listen to it now. We have the lever here on the side. Beautiful, isn't it? Again, pocket watches are also like, you know, something I search for from time to time, but not that often. I'm more focused on wrist watches. The next watch I bought again on this e-commerce platform in Switzerland, I bought quite a few things there and also I sold a few watches throughout the years. I bought this Ulysse Nardin. It's the Maxi Marine version and it's the reference number 263-22. I also have the original box and the original bracelet, but I like to wear it on this, you know, NATO strap, which I think just makes the watch a bit more, you know, military-like. I think this is the first generation of this model because it has a square date window and also, you know, a beautiful power reserve here at 12 o'clock. This watch is very important to me for one reason only. It was the watch I wore when I visited my nephew for the first time when he was born in the hospital. You know, watches for me are more, uh, you know, valuable on the emotional side. And I think there's nothing more powerful than a good story to a watch. So when I see this watch, I see myself, you know, holding my nephew in my arms for the first time. So, you know, how can you let this go? You, you just can't. The next watch we're moving into the modern era. I bought this watch, I think it was last year when I visited New York City. I went to see, you know, a few friends and also went there for a video and a business project. And we went to, I think it was the worn and wound wind up watch fair, if I'm not mistaken. I went there with my very good friend, Spanish Rob. For those who know, you know, people and watch collectors in New York, you know, he's the, the best guy to hang out with. So we went to this fair and I always knew about Zelos watches. And this was always my favorite model since they launched it. It features a bronze case, a beautiful, you know, bezel, which has a great loom on it. The indexes are, you know, elevated. The dial is made out of meteorite. And the most surprising thing is that this watch is watertight to a thousand meters. And as you can see, the crown is here at four o'clock. This watch has a lot to offer. And I think the price was around 700 US dollars, which I gladly paid when I met, you know, the founder of the brand and his girlfriend at the time or wife, I'm not really sure. So again, this watch, when I see and I look at it, reminds me of New York and contributing to the Kickstarter micro brand, you know, division of the watchmaking industry. I wear this watch maybe, you know, once or twice a year when I feel like it. It's quite a bulky watch and the strap is also very, you know, bulky as well. It reminds me of, you know, Panerai straps. But on my wrist, I think it looks cool. And the contrast between the strap, the case and the dial is really something I like. And when, once you drive with this watch and you, you go into a tunnel, you see how strong the loom is. It, they did a really good job on this. Then we move into a more modern era. And the watch I bought last year this watch I actually bought in Boston, USA. This is a Gerald Genta Bioretro watch. It features a beautiful brown dial, which uh, resembles a guilloche pattern, but I doubt it was made with a guilloche machine. I think it was uh, probably stamped. It has a retrograde date window at six o'clock, a retrograde minute track here, and a jumping hour indication at 12 o'clock. Let me show you how it moves, it's really cool. So the minute hand will jump to zero and the hour will jump to eight o'clock simultaneously. And also once a month, all three, you know, indicators jump. I was lucky because I have this watch with a box and papers. This was actually sold by the hourglass. I think it was in 2008, if I'm not mistaken. So it's really cool to have, you know, an older watch with all the box and papers. And it's in a very good condition. It fits me quite well. Again, it's on the smaller side. But I think as a, you know, a more classy watch, I would, you know, wear it to, to different occasions for sure. So the watch I also bought a while ago, and I think I bought this watch when it came out, is the Tudor Black Bay Bronze. This is the Bucherer edition, which has a beautiful blue dial and a blue bezel. I bought this watch the same year it came out because my friend Hassan, Arab watch guide from Dubai, actually told me, hey Marco, 
this watch is launching today from Tudor. Is there any chance you can maybe help me get some? And I went to Bucherer and I got him one watch. And actually, and then I also bought one for myself because I fell in love with it. <laughs> um, what's also very cool about this watch is the patina on the, you know, on the buckle as well as on the case. So if you see the case is very dark, you know, almost brownish looking. But when you turn the watch on, you can actually see the PVD coated case back. So at the beginning, the whole watch and the whole case looked like this. And now with time, it patinated. And also, I think this rich dark blue color in contrast with the, you know, warm bronze case is just unique and very beautiful. What's also very, you know, uh, distinct and I remember this day, you know, precisely is the watch has like a little scratch here on the sapphire at three o'clock. This scratch actually happened in Singapore when I was getting some food with my friend Shirag. Again, you know, this is a watch I can't sell in a way because I have this one memory to it. It, it might sound ridiculous, you know, but again, watch collecting and keeping the watches is an emotional thing, you know. And uh, again, it has a story and a memory with it. So why not just keep it forever until you really need the money? But again, I would rather sell something else than this. On the wrist, this watch always looked awesome. And again, because I have it on this green strap and with this like green jacket now as well, I think the contrast between the dial and the case is really cool. The next watch I'm gonna go to is actually also one of my latest purchases. It's the Cartier Santos. I went to the Cartier boutique in Zurich and they told me that this model is from around the era of 78 to 82. So this is one of the first Cartier Santos models. It's a very small watch, you know, for my wrist. Again, I have an 18.1 centimeter wrist size and this is, I think, a 33 millimeter watch. But because it's a very small bracelet and again, it's just beautifully made with the Cartier logo here and the, you know, B color screws and the, the bracelet, it's super comfortable. I like to wear this watch a lot actually. So out of the month, I would wear this watch maybe for a whole week, you know which is a lot if I compare to the other watches I don't even wear. And I think on my wrist it does look small, but again, because it's so old and the bracelet is so worn, it's very comfortable and that's what makes it also a pleasure to wear. And also the bracelet has a very beautiful shine, almost like an AP. Cartier is also a brand I like and I also would not mind adding a few to my collection in the future. The next watch also I wanna show you guys is the Ming. Ming watches, you know, some people like them, some people hate them. For me, I love them. I bought this watch when I was in a van, actually, with uh, three other collectors in Zurich. We were going to a watch brand, and I know this watch just launched. Luckily, all four of us got the chance to purchase this watch. So this is like a, you know, group buy, so to speak. So we all have this watch, and if we meet up, you know, one is from the US, I'm from Zurich, one is from the Netherlands and the other one is from the Czech Republic. So once we meet, you know, which maybe happens once a year because we all have busy lives and again, we live abroad. We try to have this watch and, you know, make a, a group wrist shot as we, you know, watch collectors like to do at watch meetups. Ming, I really like. I think it's not the last Ming I got. I really want to have the world timer as well. And I think what they're doing and in the future, they have a very, you know, bright uh, pad in front of them. I also made a review on this watch if you want to, you know, see all the details and technical information about it. But what also we love the most about this model is the copper dial it has. And with all these, you know, special pattern in the middle and the double sapphire crystal around the indexes. Again, for I think 1200 uh, US dollars, a very cool watch. And you know, you're, you're in this independent, uh, you know, watch collector sphere. So it makes you stand out a bit more from, you know, people who collect more mainstream brands. On the wrist, again, beautiful size. As you saw so far, I wear watches from 33 millimeters to 45 millimeters. So I don't mind mixing it up a bit. The next watch I want to talk to you about, and also I did a very extensive review on it, is my Tudor GMT. It's the Black Bay GMT version, which I wear when I travel. I put it on a bracelet now for the video. When I do travel and I wear this watch myself, I put it on the brown leather strap it comes with. I'm not the biggest fan of bracelets, 
except on my Cartier Santos and my latest acquisition, which will come at, you know, to the end. But visually, I just love a, you know, stainless steel bracelet with this beautiful case. And again, it's a travel watch. The most important thing about this watch is, like I said in the review, it was gifted to me by one of my clients, which is Bayer Chronometry in Zurich. So the watch is also inscribed on the back, which again is a very emotional, you know, meaning to me. And uh, again, this watch is not leaving the collection, you know, ever. <laughs> watches that have a real story and meaning to you are the most important watches you can have. You see on the wrist, beautiful, fits me very well. It's a bit hot now in the summertime, so I don't like, you know, bracelets to be this, you know, uh, tight. But for traveling, again, on the brown strap, it's perfect. The next watch, again, is very important to me, which, uh, surprise, surprise, is nothing new you hear on this video, right? It's the Jacob & Co. Epic X watch. So Jacob & Co. and I go back a few years already now. I used to do photography for them, and also I'm friends with the family. For me, this watch has everything I almost need in a watch. It has teardrop lugs, so the whole case is curved. It has a beautiful skeletonized movement. And again, this is a watch I wear when I don't wear a jacket maybe, or you know, I don't wear this watch a lot in winter because it's a bit on the bigger side to wear. But again, on this strap and because the lugs go downwards as well as the strap, it's super comfortable. Another thing I really like about this watch is the weight. It weighs almost nothing. I put it once on a scale and I think I got 55 grams. It has a titanium case and again, because the movement is skeletonized, it's uh, super light. So this makes the watch very comfortable, although it's a bit on the bigger size. Just for comparison, if I take the Cartier Santos and the Jacob watch next to each other, you can also see maybe the range of my collection or the range of, you know, cases and sizes I like to go. See, completely different, but I wear them both. The next watch I also got is something, again, many people love, and the video got a great response so far. It's a watch which was launched in Baselworld from Konstantin Chaikin. It's the Joker watch, as you can clearly see here. And by the way, this watch stand I bought at the MBNF gallery online. It's, I think, like a robot. Uh, really cool, huh? I think it's one of the coolest watch stands I have. And, you know, it's a pleasure to have it on the desk. You know, when you work, you just look at it. So the Joker watch is something I really like. And it's actually a piece unique. So I bought this watch one year after it came out. And I wear it from time to time. I don't wear this a lot. This is more of my, you know, special watch, a very unique piece. So I take care of it really well. This is a watch you either love or hate, I think. For me, I absolutely fell in love with it when I saw it for the first time. And I have many friends and also viewers that love this watch. You can see when you pull the crown out, the eyes move. So actually, this dial shows you the hour indication, and this is the minute indication. So now, for example, it's 12 o'clock on the dot. Now it's uh, 12.30, 12.45, 1 o'clock. And again, this watch, I think, when I bought it, was around 11,000 euros. And having a very unique watch like this is, uh, for me, it was a no-brainer. When I saw this watch and also when I see it now, I just smile and I think about, you know, collecting my, my journey, Basel world, you know, all the people you meet all the people who have this watch, which are very cool guys. And I think it just makes, again, collecting more fun. On the wrist, the Joker is definitely something people will look at and ask you, hey, what are you wearing? No watch has this appeal, no matter how expensive it is. I think people will stop you, you know, about this Joker more than about your Rolex. Although they might think the Rolex is more expensive than the Joker, which in many cases isn't the case. One of the latest purchases I'd made was actually back in last year. When I went to Singapore, I got the classic Fusion Lab Fusion. This, as you, you know, might have heard a few times already, is the collaboration with Singapore Watch Club and Hublot for their second anniversary. I had to have this watch. It features a beautiful linen dial, 
Chinese applied numerals, it is in black ceramic, rose gold on the side and the crown and the screws. And again, it's a limited edition of 30 pieces, which only close friends of the Singapore Watch Club got the you know, exclusive chance to purchase. This watch was never in the market. Um, nobody will probably sell it. If they do, I know we'll be all very angry at them. But again, life has you know its different ups and downs. So if you are in a bad situation, you need the money, nobody will be mad at you for you know taking care of yourself or your family for that matter. This is probably the watch I wear the most. And I think it's because of the comfort and also because of the strap. It doesn't stink or you know get damaged. And it also, you know looks super cool on the wrist. I mean, we can't deny that. Hublot is a brand I always wanted to have in my collection. I like the Sean Carter edition, which has also, I think, a semi-skeletonized uh, dial and a see-through uh, case pack. And I also like the New Orleanski models they made. And again, this is not the last Hublot I ever got. I'm looking into buying a few other ones. I'm just waiting for the right time. And again, this is a watch which combines you know, collecting watches with a story, with people, emotions. And if you want to know more about this watch, check out my review on it and also check out the Singapore Watch Club interview I did with Tom. In my first Q&A that I did on the channel, there was one particular question where you asked me, would I choose a Royal Oak or a Nautilus? So the answer for me is very easy. I'm a Royal Oak guy, you know, at this time of my life. Maybe in the future I will prefer a Nautilus, but at the moment the edges of the Royal Oak just speak more to me. So when the boutique of Audemars Piguet called me and told me my watch arrived, I had to buy it immediately. So this watch I reviewed on my channel not so long ago, and it is the reference number 15450 with the beautiful cobalt blue dial. This is a watch that for me is again the best bracelet watch out there. Super comfortable, very recognizable, iconic, designed by the famous uh, and late, unfortunately, Gerald Genta. The only reason I chose the 37 millimeter size is because the reference number 15400 was going out of production and a 41 millimeter 15500 reference number is not something I'm the biggest fan of. So I opted for the smaller version, which has the same dial as the 15400, just on a smaller diameter. The lines of the Royal Oak are again unique. You know, no watch is the same. Beautiful brushed bezel, uh, polished on the side, white gold screws, you know, white gold indexes, hands. And what's also nice is that it has a open case pack where you can see the gold winding rotor. So I, I spoke a few times already about having stability in your collection. So for me, I have a few, let's say, wild cards, but also a few watches like the Royal Oak, for example, which help balance out the ones where I lost money at. And again, I think for the size, and because of the bracelet is a bit bigger, the watch sits perfectly on my wrist. And again, maybe paired with this green jacket, I think it stands out a bit more as well. And nobody can argue the you know, recognizability of the Royal Oak. And once you turn it around like this, you can see how the bracelet shimmers. Like before when I told you with the Santos, it has a, uh, you know, a, a, a similar appeal. As you see, I'm not the biggest fan of bracelets. From all my collections so far, only three watches have them. And also, like I said, on the Tudor, the GMT, I switch it up when I do wear it, either to the leather strap or the NATO strap. That was it, guys, for uh, my collection so far. Let me know in the comments below which model you like the most and also which watch do you think I should get in the future. I have a lot of great watches on my you know, wish list, but again, we have to all focus on our also businesses and decide when the time is right to buy a certain piece. Or in the case of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, when the official boutique calls you, you don't even think about it. You just go there, buy the watch and figure it out later. I really wanted to show you the journey of a watch collector because sometimes people, when they see me wearing, you know, the Royal Oak or the Hublot, they think that I started with this, but no, 
it essentially started with a vintage Omega for 200 euros and then it transitioned into the Swatch watches. Being a watch collector or watch enthusiast is a journey. I am looking forward to see which watches come in the future. I have a few lined up already, which I cannot tell you about, but be sure that I'm gonna make a review about them. Give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, share with somebody who has you know, a similar passion for watches like you have, and I'll see you next time.